Welcome to the Sean Trey Show. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. I have an awesome guest with me. Now, would you like to tell everyone who you are and what you do? Well, that's a complicated question to ask. Isn't it? <laughs> answer even more complicated. <laughs> because um, uh, originally I am a composer and yeah. I do focus on composition. However, uh, as things are nowadays, composition is a very complex profession, if we could call yeah. it like that. So I'm doing much more than composing uh, in the traditional sense. So I have uh, developed a concept back in 2002. This concept is called the concept of polymediality. And um, I just try to develop all my work according to this concept. And it's um, for me even sometimes unexpected that this concept always has a potential for broadening its uh, parameters. And um, that's interesting. I think that's interesting. And in order to make it more, let's say, uh, clear to what uh, is it, I wrote even a book yeah. about it. It's uh, musicological, music aesthetical, music theoretical, music philosophical, music analytical uh, book. It's published by Schott in Germany. And nice. uh, in it, I try with uh, musical needs to explain what is the theory and how it finds application in praxis, which in the end, this is what yes. interests us mostly. So, right. uh, furthermore, uh, I am uh, directing uh, projects, mostly my own projects, which they have uh, a large uh, scale and they are quite demanding and they expand the boundaries of music in the sense that uh, many institutions and not just one or even an entire city or even regions are taking uh, part uh, in it. So it needs someone to manage, to direct both managerial and artistic all these different uh, lines that run mm -hmm. parallel. But uh, as the concept of polymediality says, it has to put everything in a sense meaningful ratio and this is my task <laughs> and so this is what i aim for so we just even hear dogs and you will not imagine that back i think it was already 10 years ago i was asked even to make a concept for dogs <laughs> and with dogs <laughs> well, my, my dog was just dreaming right there he was dreaming that's and the sounds that are coming <laughs> he was like he was sleeping and he's in his dream and he's, he's chasing something but that's so interesting because what that's how i found you like i i, I to find people for this show i i go through instagram and youtube looking for interesting concepts and i was on the the uh, uh pro tools avid avid's page and, and Avid had this really amazing image of you. And you were standing in a bamboo grove. And you could hear the, the, the symphony that was in the natural sound of these, these bamboo um, trees just, just hitting against each other. And it was, it was magical. And you were capturing it. And then you sent me your, your piece that it was part of, the sounds of Kyoto. And I was just like blown away that you were combining natural sounds with with a comp with with these compositions. It was it was it was very striking and powerful. Yes, and this is I think one of the exciting parameters of the concept of polymediality to stay and follow. Let's say this original idea uh, in this concept, the musical source can be very diversified. And it doesn't come necessary from, let's say, traditionally understood sources. So it's not, a sound doesn't necessarily come in music from uh, an instrument or a voice. And on the other hand, yeah, there is this, uh, let's say, uh, another aesthetical approach of music, the so-called soundscape. And uh, I, what I try to do is just combine all these various 
inhomogeneous, heterogeneous sources of sound and put them together in what we called before a sense meaningful ratio uh, of the elements. Uh, on the video, what you saw, producer and Evit, uh, it was wonderful that they presented it. <laughs> so really awesome. you see that actually I record natural sounds. I just look for natural la um, soundscapes or even uh, individual sounds that are characteristic for a specific region. Uh, and on this region, I'm just trying to develop uh, a project. That's why the bamboo forest, the so-called Sagano, uh, it's very typical for Kyoto. But what you see there, of course, I record the sound, so you would imagine I'm not composer anymore, I am a sound recordist. So this is uh, part of the process, because to find, to research the sound, where is the sound, to record the sound, and maybe you have uh, maybe seen some on other pages, people ask mm -hmm. why I use various microphones, and one microphone up, one microphone down, small, bigger, and so on. So this is uh, in a kind of polyphonic uh, understanding of a chord. A chord is, let's say, it has at least two notes. And yeah. maybe in a different sense, to make it more visualized, understandable, it's like the high definition uh, photography. So you just shoot mm. various with different lights and so on, and then combine all this, and then you make the yeah. final uh, result, which is actually not a single image, but is a synthetic uh, setting of various uh, layers. And on the same uh, manner, I do the recording. At the same time, um, I want to say that I am not the core recordist, uh, in these projects, I just mainly go, I find uh, the sounds and then we go in studio, we analyze the frequencies and then there is a professional uh, recording team and then they go there again and they make a more, let's say, professional sound. After I get these sounds back, I get in studio and I am together, uh, let's say, with the material from the traditional music uh, groups, yeah. traditional, I mean, what do you understand? The symphony orchestra, choir, yeah. quartet. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, this can be even uh, unconventional, like the so-called uh, theremin ensemble, which is yeah, 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 in yeah. Japan uh, very unique, and maybe the yeah. only one uh, in the world. So I just try to combine all these elements in the sense of harmony. And that's why I call it polymediality, because poly, it has this association with with polyphony, with poly polymetric, with polyrhythmic. So it has a yeah. more music um, focusing um, understanding. Multi mm -hmm. has this numeric, uh, let's say, uh, more um, uh, element in it. And yeah. there is a very interesting phrase from Aristotle who says that the sum is more than, its indivi than the individual parts. And yep. this is how I understand uh, polyphony, and this is how I understand also the idea of polymediality. That's really wonderful. You know, it's, it's interesting because when I was looking at these projects, you, you, you sent me the sounds of Vladivostok, the sounds of Kyoto. I live in Vietnam, and I also, I'm from California, but I grew up in, in London and, and, and all over the US. And, and each, everywhere that I live, there's a sound that just, the general tone, and and, and so if I were to play, you know, and, and I forget about that, living in a place, but then if I'm doing a, a FaceTime call with someone and my windows are open, people are like, oh, I can hear the motorcycles. I can hear people. I can, cause, cause this is an outdoor culture here. Everyone's outside all the time. There's roosters, there's there's other sounds, you know, and, and like, you know, people will have pet roosters. And so you'll hear the cock -a -loo -loo, and, and like, even though we're in a big city, you have these sounds that are constantly there but like when i was listening to the vladivostok one it was very beautiful and then you finished with the sound of ice and that is such a you know it's something that people don't know per se but it's so powerful to combine that to combine these sounds and it's almost like there's a signature each each city yeah. has its own unique signature uh, of sounds and then combining that with the the symphony is oh, yeah. it's amazing you say it it's very uh, correct and in the same, let's say, approach that I understand the whole process and, of course, the result. 
Um, but interestingly, what you just described, I made one uh, TEDx speech some years ago, and the subject was the soundtrack of our life, something like that. Yeah. So, and <laughs> what I just trying to explain is that we all here for various reasons. And mm -hmm. if we just focus on what we hear consciously, we get a lot of information and not just yeah. uh, for the musicians, but for everyone. And I gave an example of the, uh, let's say, the engine of a muscle car or let's say, of a supercar, of a noisy car in the end. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so, right. And if we just hear this uh, sound, uh, according to who hears the sound and how much is uh, sensible on hearing this acoustic information, we all get some very interesting data. <laughs> and I can say in a very uh, simple way that if we are musicians, we might hear frequencies, so we might hear a more interesting musical texture because uh, the sound of an engine is a polyphonic one. If someone is uh, an engineer, a uh, car engineer, most probably he will hear how good the engine is or if exactly. the engine has... Uh, it's modified or if the engine needs maybe some service <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, someone else who is for the environment, most probably he will uh, acknowledge this as a noise pollution. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that should be avoided. And then we come, of course, in the uh, current futuristic approach that vehicles should have no sound. But this is called sound in the sense that uh, gas and diesel and all this has been burning. So they try to stimulate the sound <laughs> ecologically mm -hmm. through other technical means that it's pretending to be what it is. So then comes another person who may be specialized in software or in these technological advancements. And he says, ah, they did a very good job in the studio to give this right. car this specific sound. So... In the end, everyone is hearing uh, information and uh, it is uh, helping our lives uh, to be able to recognize all what is happening around, around us. That's a phenomenally interesting... When I, when I first moved over outside of the US, one of the things that I was struck by was the ability to hear um, in a new way. That we we grow up hearing our own language spoken to us and that language is constantly layered with meaning different types of meaning you know it's not just the words it's the tone the style and the presentation but then when you suddenly step into a new place that you do not speak the language and your ability to understand the words is gone you have to rely on other other methods of interpretation and tone becomes really interesting. Um, the volume becomes interesting because you don't understand the words. Like, hey, is this person yelling or are they quiet? And those, and, and, and then the, the just, the general sounds around you are amplified because you're not understanding your, our brains are so often trying to process speech that suddenly you're not understanding anything. And it, I was like, wow, I'm just listening to all these other sounds. And so it's a very interesting and so true because, you know, if you hear a certain sound, like I was thinking immediately, you know, some person would hear that car and go, it needs to be fixed. And another person goes, uh, that sounds nice. You know, it's just, it sounds good. Another person, oh, that's so horrible. You know, you're, you're, you're spot on. What you were describing though, reminds me of one of the movies that I absolutely love that uh, played into this was, um, 1990 something the movie by bjork dancer in the dark a and one of the things in that movie was that the she lived in this world that was all her own and she everyday noises became a symphony for her and the audience was transformed and, and that's what immediately what i thought of when i listened to some of your pieces like there's this symphony that's happening with, yes. with these everyday sounds. That's very, very well said. And even the subtitle of Sound of Kyoto, it's called City in a Symphony. That's beautiful. 
So this is a very uh, challenging approach, how to put all elements into one piece of music. Because right. symphony, like synthesis, is just an additive uh, process. However, it does not re uh, stay in this numeric level, but uh, it's, and this is, let's say, the um, ability or maybe the, um, the essence of the composer <laughs> mm -hmm. to put all these uh, things together so that they make um, a meaning. And in the end, they have an aesthetic, an aesthetic impact, because uh, to me, uh, music creation is not just the work done uh, in the office, or in the music studio, or in the production studio, or even in front of a computer, or whatever. Right. Today, have many means. Uh, even to notate music, this is another interesting uh, parameter that. Once I did uh, uh, research in Vienna, I was investigating the various formats that uh, music can be notated in order to be passed through the time to the next uh, generations, let's call mm -hmm. it this, more extended dimension, so that um, uh, what has been conceived by the composer or by the music maker can be understood and put together uh, uh, let's say in praxis and realize his ideas in sound. So uh, to make it short, synthesis is a very complex uh, process um, uh, for me and I think this is not something that it is complicated, it is something that is challenging and it brings us to new um, I believe developments and to new results or to new advancements or it forces us to find new ways even to realize our musical idea. And uh, that's why, uh, even to answer part of your question at the beginning, I am not just a composer. I'm also negotiating with uh, companies to find software or even how to find hardware to enable uh, a musical um, idea. So even uh, developing a new guitar model with a Greek luthier, uh, even developed uh, in-ear monitors, you have uh, one already. So we try to find one with uh, a company that is based here in Cyprus, but has Italian roots, uh, to find one model that, let's say, it is more um, uh, effective to hear soundscapes when someone is outside and even to mm. hear uh, high fidelity uh, music. Uh, in a more general uh, approach, uh, in the sense of it, uh, it, let's say it goes to uh, have the certain frequencies or a certain level of frequency so that it is possible to enjoy both classical, pop, rock and all kind of, of music which is quite challenging and not easy at all. But this is what forces us to come, I think, uh, further in our That's lives awesome. and, of course, in the music development. Right. Well, well I, I want to take it back, though. How did you get started in music? How did you begin your, your musical journey? Uh, this is, again, uh, quite... <laughs> quite a complicated... <laughs> uh, maybe not complicated, but a long story. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's a good story. Let's hear it. <laughs> uh, well, maybe I can say you how I got um, uh, influenced and find a sensible um, contact with sounds in general, because this is how it made me understand what is music. So music has to do with senseful and consciousness um, listening, not hearing. <laughs> yes, yes. So, and um, when um, um, I come from an island, uh, that uh, due to uh, tragic events uh, in 1974, uh, my parents were forced to abandon their roots and uh, get to live, forced to live in another place. So uh, at the beginning, this happened in 1974, I was born four years later. 
So, and the conditions in the house were such that um, made me aware of sounds, especially in silence. So this is also a very interesting parameter, what yeah. is silence that we all know, but not silence in music, silence in our lives. So the mm. negative or the opposite or the antithesis of what we said before. And again, what information might lead us. And uh, the information I want to, uh, let's say, uh, mention now, it's that sounds bring us memories. Sounds bring yes. us maybe our own story, our own history that goes often beyond the personal experiences. So, and after, uh, let's say, this incident in 1974, I was born four years later, and so because the situation was so vague and so um, complicated, uh, we used to live in a house, and every night the roof uh, used to leak. So, I remember uh, one uh, metal uh, can, tin, whatever, that it was put on the ground and every night I would hear the drops from the floor falling one after another in this can. So you can imagine silence after the tragic events, one single drop falling uh, rhythmically and systematically even we can say it, in this drop and uh, you hear this every night and you cannot uh, stay calm. So this for me was like a bullet in my heart. And this bullet was not, uh, let's say, a real one. It was the sound of the drop. Mm. So through this way, I became, firstly, this is from my childhood memories, was very strong. And of course, many other uh, experiences afterwards that lead me to have this sensitivity for what uh, is happening around. At the same time, I liked other occupations. I wanted to be a pilot for the Air Force. I liked this, you know, yeah. <laughs> freedom and all this maneuver. <laughs> yeah, right. And I liked space. Uh, of course, I liked silence, fashion, and so on. But um, due to the fact that my parents, besides their main occupations, they had a fable for traditional arts and crafts, I get uh, to know, let's say, this more folkloric uh, creation. And that mm -hmm. comes from authentic uh, people. Maybe that yeah. we rarely find nowadays. Yeah. So, uh, you understand very well. So, so through this, all these experiences, it led me, of course, with music education. This is clear. I started in Austria, uh, in Mozarteum, and at the U Music University in Vienna. So I had the best... <laughs> yeah, uh, right. That's amazing. Believe for education that I could uh, I could have. So and uh, I am thankful uh, to all this. I would say in a kind of I am like a monomach, so like single fighter in the sense that I am standing alone. I'm just following the concept from the beginning, and uh, I'm uh, happy. Why? Because I find more and more people who share and the same vision and the same idea. And uh, we try to enable this every time with a new uh, context, with a new challenge and in different geographical positions on our earth. Yeah, yep. that's so true. It, it, it's, it's really special that you, you talk about that. Going back to the story of the, the water dropping, I, um, I watched this one movie it was a Vietnamese language movie done by a Vietnamese French director. And it was called The Scent of Green Papaya. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that this director was really good at was he stayed, so many filmmakers want to follow the dialogue. They want to have this talking. And, and one of the po things that you pointed out, and my friend, uh, Jason Arujo is a it was a music major in university, and one of the things he we would talk about music, and he would tell me that like music is created by the silence between notes. Mm -hmm. it, it, people think of it as the notes are the important part, and he's like the silence is as important as the notes because the silence defines the notes, it defines the sounds, and in this movie, Scent of Green Papaya. 
um, the director gives a lot of time to sounds and to visual things. Like the plot just happens slowly through the film. And there's this one scene where it's a rainy day and the raindrops fall into this, this basin of water. And it was just like, and you're watching it. And he, the director spends 30 seconds on the shot. And, and like before any action happens, you have 30 seconds of just this water drops falling. And it's just like, wow. In that it created this amazing amount of tension. And you don't think about that, but you're just anticipation for that next drop. It's powerful. Yes. As far as um, single elements are being focused, and put in such a dramaturgy. This is, uh, besides silence, a very interesting uh, word. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, why dramaturgy is so important is because it makes the drama. Uh, mm -hmm. Drama, uh, not in the sense of something is <laughs> in the negative sense. Yeah. So drama is to create um, uh, anticipation, is to just yeah make the, the audience or the viewer or whatever just uh, stay focused and just you take his con uh, you take the conscious and the um, concentration and you take him full with soul and senses with you and I think this is um, the magic if we could call it like that of the maker yeah. that can take you fully and put you in let's say, in this cosmos that the creator um, yes. uh, achieved. And I think this is uh, a high... Um, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's very high purpose if someone yeah. uh, achieves this. Yeah. And since, um, as you know, I come from a um, tradition uh, that it is more... Uh, let's say standing on the roots of such uh, artistic perception and I speak about the ancient Greek uh, yeah. drama and of course yeah. comedy which personally I find very very interesting and very few uh, to very little exploited uh, in music I mean in mm -hmm. comparison to um, to the more serious and happy, <laughs> you know. Right. So, um, um, yeah, uh, outcomes, what music makes, although in pop music, this is maybe more often than uh, yeah. in classical. So uh, this is very uh, important to follow, let's say, this dramaturgical um, idea that actually even if we think of how the uh, genre of opera uh, has been developed. Actually, yes. it comes out of the so-called the theorem, the theorem was. This is mm. uh, uh, was like, and the the words uh, tragedy and comedy. Uh, mm -hmm. They go back to this, um, let's say, form of re recitating a poem, and mm. uh, this is the idea of short, long, short, long, short, short, long, and actually it was one single. Um, person who was recitating a poem and then mm -hmm. the ancient Greeks said uh, thought ah, this is good but it could be even more interesting if you have a second mm -hmm. person that is making the antithesis or the contrast uh, to the one who is just resident so let's put two persons so uh, that maybe they are fighting sometimes so sometimes maybe they agree sometimes they go different directions and then they meet so and after they said, ah, this is also interesting, but maybe it could be even more interesting. So let's put the choir, uh, or the so-called chorus, chorus. So this is the idea that the people have an idea of what these two people are speaking, you know? Yeah. Right. Like the citizens or yeah. the people of the art. And following this idea, then came the costumes, then came the sound effects, yeah. uh, the prosa, and how this is made, and also And on this, actually, opera had uh, influence, Monteverdi uh, and all these people uh, took even um, uh, Richard Wagner was very much influenced yeah. by uh, this uh, ancient tragedy. So uh, what 
in the end we realize we are just uh, following uh, a line that began <laughs> a long time ago and uh, it's um, uh, interesting to see how all this uh, will uh, you know develop in the near future but also to its extent right well and it's 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 interesting because you know there was a there's a great that great statement we're standing on the shoulders of giants and and I, 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 I study screenwriting now, and I'm a filmmaker. And one of the interesting things is as I'm, I remember in university, I studied, I did a great class on the Greek poets and the Greek and Greek playwrights. And I would read Sophocles and Aristophanes. And, and it, was, it was amazing to read these, 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 these plays that were composed thousands of years before. And yet they were still beautifully done and relevant and, and and masterfully crafted and and to realize that the seeds of what we take we see now were planted millennia ago and, and that that mankind has been exploring emotions and exploring thoughts and 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 our perceptions for thousands of years and and this this art form has just been refined over time through music and and the and, and the arts it's amazing yes and even to go further because now i see in frame uh, there is one book called wagnerism so this is a book that goes even beyond what we said uh, it analyzes the ideas that music and uh, the personality of Wagner has mm. has in political uh, level. Mm. So arts, uh, this is very interesting that actually arts, and even last week I had the honor to get an award and it was the president of the Republic in Cyprus present. And I said, um, I just got the courage and I said one interesting phrase by Evgen Ionesco. This is uh, yeah. maybe, you know, Romanian, French um, yeah. theater maker of the abstract. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and he said that uh, in more freely uh, interpretation <laughs> that uh, <laughs> arts uh, lead, politics follow. So this uh, Wagnerism, it's, and of course many other uh, politicians, Lorno was another example, uh, had this even influence or the work has influence. But what I want to say, and in my understanding, art for me doesn't necessarily have to uh, focus on the political uh, you know, dimension. But uh, political uh, situations happening around could influence uh, the composer or the music uh, maker, even in popular music, this gets uh, from now and then um, uh, serious uh, uh, mm -hmm. well, impact. You see even yeah. for popular artists uh, are able to make a campaign and influence the elections in the United States, you know, the president. Yeah. So it's in mm -hmm. United Kingdom, uh, the same in many countries. So uh, this is, uh, and to go again back in our, um, uh, in your question, what, what am I doing or who is a composer? I'm not saying that I am a politician in this sense, but uh, parallel to art, I try to serve, I would say, humanitarian values. And this is my uh, concern. And I'm very often uh, inspired by, uh, let's say, the value of democracy. This was the large, uh, the, yeah. the latest large project I did for the uh, Greek independence two year, hundred years after the Greek revolution in Athens. And it's the idea about uh, liberty and, you know, and all the values that are associated with uh, the liberty. So, for example, democracy. And yeah. I do believe that artists uh, have the power or at least have the ability to have sayings uh, on this. And this can be for the um, profit, for the, uh, I mean, profit, in the positive sense of humanity. And this. And I am so <laughs> with you on that. And there's a point here that I want to dive in. I generally stay away from politics, but I want to wade into it a little bit because 
One of the things that I've noticed as well, and you, you, you touched on this, is that the importance of, I, I believe as well, the importance of democracy, the importance of, of, of this freedom of expression. Because one of the things that you notice with, when you start seeing authoritarian regimes beginning to clamp down, the ple- pe- people they clamp down on first are the artists, the poets, the musicians. And why is that? Why is it that they camp down on it? Because they understand the inherent power of, of a poet. Yes. There was a story of one country in Asia in which <coughs> they imprisoned a poet for 40 years. 40 years they imprisoned this poet. Why? Because they understood the power of words, the power of art, and, and that, you know, there are countries around the world that still ban songs. They ban them from certain composers. They ban music. They ban movies. Why? Because they want to control the people. And if they, if the people have the ability to think, they have the ability to ask questions. And art forces people to ask questions. And this is one of the things that coming back to the sounds of a city, it humanizes people. You, 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 you suddenly get drawn closer to to the people of Vladivostok. You get drawn closer to the people of Kyoto. One of the things growing up in the US in the 80s, Russians were evil. Russians were villains. And then after that, the fall of the Soviet Union, well, it wasn't Russians anymore. Hollywood painted other groups as villains, and this group as villains. And one of the things that I, I, I noticed when I watched Vladivostok, your, your sounds of Vladivostok, how similar those people were to me. How much the sounds were like my sounds, you know, the sounds that I lived with. And I think that that's what art does. Art is this, is this eraser that erases cont- uh, pretense. It erases these ideas that we have about who we are and what we believe. And when you can erase that, people are left vulnerable. We're left naked with our true emotions, our true feelings. And that's that we're all the same. We're all similar, you know? We are all made of the same ingredients. So, (laughs) uh, and um, the question is how, and I, it's interesting to say we are not finding ourselves, we are creating ourselves. Yes. And um, we all are humans. We have the same uh, particles in us and the same senses and everything is the same. We breathe the same air. Okay, some more polluted, some less polluted. But but in the end, we have the same um, prerequisites to create ourselves. And uh, the question is how uh, we do it. And I think this is the big uh, question. And uh, there are many interesting uh, parameters. For example, what is the idea of patriotism? You said before about, you know, that the Soviets or the Russians are playing, let's say, the bad guys in the Hollywood films. Or yep. maybe in general, it gives this idea. But we don't, we do not have to forget that the Russians contributed many uh, for their uh, lives, uh, for ending, for example, uh, the Nazi regime and many things. Exactly. And people even suffered, but only if someone goes there and meets yes. the authentic people. This is what I said even before about the folklore arts. You know, these are the real. Yes. Uh, let's see. These are true artists in, in the essence that they are pure. They just uh, know uh, what they do. They don't have the feeling of the evil uh, inside them or the feeling of propaganda. They do right. <laughs> what, what they do with honesty and with uh, love and just uh, uh, making efforts to contribute to the good and to a valuable society. I love that. And um, it is a pity if this idea is being manipulated with, um, let's say, often uh, means that made the human identity uh, in a way modified from its original source 
how it is being made. <laughs> yeah. I completely agree. Yes. Now, now, if you could go back and give young musicians, if you could give young musicians some advice as they journey on their their career, young composers, what, what advice would you give them? Ah, this is a question that I often get. <laughs> Recently, there was I just uh, had a lecture in university in Australia, and there was one uh, person from Philippines who asked the same, um, <laughs> in the sense that he comes from a different cultural background. He now mm -hmm. studies in totally different, you know, different uh, country, context from different what country. he was born and what. And uh, the question is. How does it go further? Uh, <laughs> I think well, this, let me, is, this let is... Me, let, me, let me reframe it then. I yes. want to change the question so it's a little different. Please. <laughs> what advice would you give to yourself? Younger version of yourself. What advice would you give yourself if you could go back in time about your journey? Uh, I believe I had... Uh, I was lucky enough to make good choices <laughs> yes, I understand this now. <laughs> I hope in 10, 20 <laughs> years I will say the same. Right. So, <laughs> what I really, or what was very important to me is to have the best possible I could get. I wanted the best like possible education in my understanding. Maybe what yeah, is yeah. best for me might be other best for you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, since um, we aim for something, we have our own understanding of uh, things and our own goals and, of course, our own capacities and how much we can and we want to offer from our lives and, of course, with which manners because they all have consequences. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I wanted to focus only on the, let's say, on the good sides, on the values that I said before and, at the same time, aim to what was the best possible uh, for me to get. And this started, of course, from the education. So I yeah. wanted to have a very strong or as strong and versatile uh, education within an environment that is, for me, inspiring. And it pushes me always uh, to come every time one step further from what I believed uh, uh, I am or I was. So, I think this is very important and what I also realized during my studies in Austria, uh, in Germany, also studied in Switzerland, in Basel uh, for one year composition. So, uh, I wanted to get as many experiences with relevant subjects to music. So, the, what I mean is, for example, um, let's say traditional composition is not the only uh, sort of composition, there is even electronic composition, there is yeah. composition with uh, non-traditional sounds, there is composition even on the conceptual uh, dimension, there is a composition that is more technical, so there is composition that is more technological, <laughs> there is composition with less engagement of humans with more engagement of, uh, let's say, robots or whatever. Yeah. This can be, and at the same time, have also a more understanding of what is behind that. With this, I mean, for example, theory, uh, philosophy, uh, interpretation, and uh, even getting uh, information from non or outer musical uh, sciences. Uh, this is, uh, it can be anthroposophy, it can, be, it can be something with ethnology, uh, so with astronomy, with space mm -hmm. discoveries. So what? It's for someone exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the that. more uh, I am really uh, uh, sure about this, that the moment you find what excites you, you always never stop uh, wanting yeah. to know more and going further and challenging more. So yes. I always I like to challenge the comfort zone, <laughs> meaning I that uh, what I know is never enough. <laughs> uh, in this uh, sense, you know, even now I am on this uh, um, following what or trying to follow all what is possible to follow 
and what is happening. And uh, I think this is very uh, important for young musicians because uh, music creation, I think it might be similar to what it was before, but it's not the same, uh, I think. And there are even software that compose for you. So, <laughs> or there are many occasions from well-known composers who apparently mm, they were not the uh, lonely composers of the work that they wrote their single name. So, uh, let's say the context of composition has is changing. Uh, yes. and the process and who is composing and who is the uh, let's say in the end the copyright owner of mm -hmm. the final product so this is um, interesting era that uh, we are focusing and I think just to uh, summarize again uh, trying aiming to go for the best uh, and try to be aware that I want to get there and even if I cannot get as fast as I thought at this point, never abandoned this target and always follow, let's say, even step by step until you get there. And then this, this brings to the next uh, end goal and always just try to expand on limits and never be satisfied of what we can do now and be aware and believe that in one year we can do more. <laughs> I love that. It's like a better every day. And that's, that's, that's what I try to tell, you know, myself is like, I, maybe I'm not at my, where I want to be yet, but if I can get one step better every day, then eventually I will get somewhere, you know? Yes. And, uh, it's what we say. It takes many years to have an overnight success. Exactly. <laughs> so true. Even if it's popular so music true. or popular culture, people yeah. think uh, that it's very easy, but maybe for some people it is easy. But there is, I mean, easy in the sense uh, compared to some others that who work hard for many years, even decades. But there is another uh, aspect that uh, it is very important, at least to me, and this is the sustainability and how yes. this can last in time and how valuable and worthy it is from its ingredients so that through the time it gets more and more value and it gets more and more, let's say, importance. Because um, this is something, at least for uh, a worthy um, musical piece or artwork or piece of music in popular music, it's not different or in popular culture we see. They are, that's why I call these all-time classics because yes. they have some certain values that last in time and never lose, lose their originality and uh, their value no matter how many years we pass. <laughs> that's so true. Well, brother, I want to say thank you so much for today. This has been absolutely amazing and I've learned so much. Now, I, I look forward to seeing more of your work and, and I, I would love for you to come back on sometime. For sure. Thank you for this very inspiring uh, and I'm happy to spread the word through in Vietnam as well. And I love it, man. I believe culture unites uh, people. We are living in an era that it is even a complicated uh, manner and uh, music has the power to unite uh, people and that we can focus on common goals that it's actually the values of the human existence. I love that, man. Well, you should definitely come visit Vietnam sometime. There's some really powerful sounds here, man. It's going to um, be fun. Definitely. So when we make sound of Vietnam, be sure. <laughs> I think that'd be awesome. I think that'd be awesome. Uh...